Hello, and welcome to the Opus Wealth Style Podcast. My name is Evan. I'll be your host today. Uh, Yvonne's taking a break, or I'm sure he's not actually taking a break. He's got other important things to do. But uh, today, excited for our guest, Josh Karen. Josh, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, Evan. How are you? My guess is that Yvonne is just purposely avoiding me. That's what I'm going for. I I I don't I don't disagree. We'll uh, we'll see. Although every time he talks about you, it's always very highly. Um, I was uh, you were on the podcast a couple of years ago. I was actually listening to it uh, just recently. Uh, at the time, it was uh, the beginning of COVID. It was it was 2019, and uh, your wife was pregnant. How's uh, how's everyone doing? Uh, that was the before times, uh, both COVID wise and baby wise. But we've yeah. now got a two and a half year old who is amazing, getting a little bit over a cold and a little bit of a sore throat. But everybody's good, no complaints. Yeah, good. There you go. You look uh, relatively west- rested. You look good. Uh, yeah, I've just got a whole bunch more gray hair, which yeah. is fine. That's uh, that's how it goes. Uh, well, good. So, uh, Josh, you uh, you work at uh, Finseca. You are the uh, Vice President of Federal Affairs. Uh, for the listening audience, if I ever have a question, I or any of my coworkers ever have a question about what's going on uh, in Congress and Capitol Hill, what are what are some possible uh, things that are that are coming out of there that are either going to impact our clients, our industry? Uh, Finseca, Josh is always uh, our our go to person. So, Josh, maybe spend a, a few minutes uh, just on what is Finseca and what what is your role uh, there and with the industry. Yeah, of course. Um, so, we are a national trade association. There's around eight thousand members, just like Evan and Ivan, all across the country, uh, who are striving to help their clients live more financially secure lives. Uh, It's really that holistic blend that we feel uh, really provides the best possible outcomes for consumers in the marketplace, that mixture of holistic advice, uh, you know, financial planning uh, with life insurance, annuities and investments at its core, uh, and making sure that, you know, you're stocking away enough for retirement so you can live a a really comfortable life in retirement. Um, So as an organization, uh, you know, we do a whole bunch of different things, but clearly as it relates to me and my role, Uh, We engage and advocate on our members' behalf and the clients that they serve uh, to make sure that Congress really understands uh, the sort of nitty gritty about holistic planning, how Evan interacts with his clients, uh, and, you know, making sure that uh, those uh, are enshrined in public policy uh, so that more uh, Americans can get access to advice and more Americans can live financially secure roles or financially secure lives. So really my role, tip of the spear on that front, uh, I engage with federal policymakers, whether it's members of Congress, uh, their staff, uh, regulatory agencies, et cetera, uh, to make sure that they've got access to the best possible information. They've got access to folks like Evan, to folks like Yvonne. So as they're making judgments about life insurance and about the world uh, that y'all live in, uh, we get the right outcomes there. So a little bit about us and a little about me in a nutshell. And so Finseca is they they do a you guys do an incredible job of communicating to us what's what's coming up, what's important, and then more importantly, what are the actions that we need to take or could take? Who who should we be speaking to? Who are the congressmen and women that we should be speaking to uh, on on various topics? So it's it's incredibly uh, helpful, invaluable to so many people that just don't even realize that this is this is a whole industry that is that is going on on a regular basis, keeping you busy. Hundred percent. And and so the one of the main reasons we wanted to have you back on is to talk about Secure 2.0. Um, there's a lot in it. There's a there's a lot of different ways we can go, and we're not going to spend that much time uh, today going through all of them. But uh, and I do want to touch on a, on a few other topics. But as it relates to Secure 2.0, probably the the biggest thing that has impacted the financial services industry in the last you know, you know little while or most recently anyway. Um, are, are there maybe what are the top uh, you know three or five things that you think people are, uh, really need to know that that changed from you know, previous? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, first I'll start. This is a great piece of legislation and is the product of a lot of hard work mm-hmm. over the last handful of years. Uh, of course, we had Secure 1.0 uh, at the end of 2019, but you know the way I sort of describe it in a lot of ways is that was the first sort of systemic rewrite 
of our retirement system in 30 plus years in this country. So there was a lot of sort of that underbrush that just had to be wiped clean uh, so that we can continue to improve uh, the processes, the structures, the opportunities uh, that we have in the retirement space today. Uh, and and not to cut you off, but just to, to set some context for, for the listening audience, what what happened, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in somewhere in the 80s, the 401k uh, came into existence, right? And so previously, before the 401k existed, every almost everyone had pensions. Does that sound about right, right? And so pensions meant that the employee, the individual, did not really have much uh, stake in saving for their retirement because their employer would save for their retirement. And as people started to live longer, uh, that became too burdensome for a lot of businesses. And long story short, they Congress introduced the 401k to shift that burden onto the individual. And so it's the individual's responsibility now to save for retirement, both with 401ks, pensions are extremely, uh, uh, very rare these days. Uh, and so it's the individual's responsibility to save for retirement. And not everyone does a great job. I, I'm constantly hearing statistics about uh, I, a lot of the, I think the baby boomer generation are just very unprepared for retirement and hence, therefore, you know, that's why we're, you guys are working so hard to to make some changes to help alleviate that. Does that all sound right? All sounds right. $7 trillion, Evan, is the number. There's a $7 trillion gap between what Americans currently have saved for retirement and what they're actually going to need when they get there. Uh, it's a staggering amount of money. Uh, it's only gotten worse over the last handful of years with the pandemic, uh, all the sort of changes and impact to folks uh, who were trying to save. Uh, and really, you know, again, too, just to bring up, you know, another point that you sort of made in there, which is so much over the last 20, 30 years has sort of shifted the onus and the responsibility onto the individual to plan for their retirement mm -hmm. rather than, hey, my company's got a pension. I'm going to have it until I die. Great, grand, wonderful. Let's go. And that really highlights the need uh, for holistic planning as you're thinking about all this stuff. I mean, we'll talk about secure, obviously, and a couple of the provisions that are in there that mm -hmm. are pretty impactful. Um, but those are just provisions. Those are just tools, right? Uh, without somebody who can kind of help you construct the right plan for you, doesn't really do a whole lot. People talk about all the time, well, I'm ready for you know, retirement, I got a 401k mm -hmm. it's a product. It's not a plan. Uh, it's yeah. a bucket of assets that then you have to deploy effectively to be able to meet your needs. And that comes with a lot of different responsibilities. So um, there's definitely been a lot, but that $7 trillion number sticks out in my head a lot. It's part of what uh, really uh, motivated Congress uh, to prioritize retirement in a Congress last year that I had a bunch of big picture bipartisan things get done, uh, like the infrastructure package, et cetera, you know, retirement sort of on equal footing in terms of, uh, you know, priority for Congress. Um, so the things that are in there, Evan, I mean, there's a bunch, there's 90 plus provisions. Uh, as you said, I'm not by any mm -hmm. stretch of the imagination going to try to run you through the litany of what's in, in each and every one of them. I think my biggest takeaway, though, uh, is this piece of legislation is expected to uh, create billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in new retirement savings over the course of the next 10 years. Um, there's a bunch of uh, provisions in here around catch up contributions and those sorts of mm -hmm. things uh, that will really help folks uh, save more for retirement. Uh, solely indexing some of those things to inflation will do a whole bunch. So I think it's really going to help a lot of Americans do a bunch of different things. Uh, but if you feel like you've got more money in these accounts, that gives you a little bit more flexibility in present day, uh, maybe to go out there and make an investment or make a purchase of a product because you know that your retirement account is growing a little bit stronger and a little bit faster, uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility present day. Uh, and then hopefully it allows you to make sure that you don't run out of money, uh, you know, as you get into retirement, especially as retirements get longer. I think a couple of the ones that I'll highlight, uh, especially from the individual side of things, there's a whole bunch of things on the business side uh, that mm -hmm. are really relevant, really important. I personally think the biggest provision in this entire package is the auto enrollment mandate, uh, which will um, new businesses as they're creating qualified plans instead of you having the option as an employee to opt in and participate in the plan, the default will be that you are automatically enrolled unless you choose to opt out. It's going to get a whole bunch more people saving. Uh, so there, so that was an option. It was an option prior, but now it's a mandate. Is that, is that right? So yeah, you could have uh, structured your plan to do auto enrollment uh, prior to this. A business could have made that selection. Uh, they've made it a little bit easier and a little bit more efficient from the business perspective, from a cost side. 
to be able to do it now. And it's got an auto escalation piece in there, which is important, right? Uh, Adds on 1% year over year. Uh, But for new businesses who are existing businesses who are creating new plans, uh, that's going to be a uh, required feature, uh, not one that's optional anymore. Some exceptions, smaller sized businesses, Mm -hmm. church plans, et cetera. Um, That's probably the biggest provision, very honestly, in this entire package. I think, though, the couple others that I'd highlight, uh, the RMD catch-up contribution world is changing a lot. Uh, of course, RMDs and Secure 1.0 uh, went up to 72. Uh, now for, going- for our audience, RMD stands for Required Minimum Distributions. When you hit a certain age, you, the IRS forces that you, you take out a certain amount from your IRA, which creates a taxable event. Totally. Um, so now they're going to push that up to 73 for this year and then 75 in 2033. Um, so that's going to give folks the option to keep their dollars in mm-hmm. uh, their IRA a little bit longer uh, and allow it to continue to grow. Hopefully that provides more opportunities for planning. Mm-hmm. Uh, catch-up contributions got changed pretty significantly. Uh, you know, you've always been able to throw in a little bit more uh, once you hit your 50s. It had been $1,000, uh, but it wasn't indexed to inflation. Uh, now it's going to be indexed to inflation. That's going to allow that number to grow higher over the course of, you know, as the years go on. That's a positive 61, 62, 63 uh, allows folks to uh, even higher contribution levels. Uh, it's going to take that cap from uh, 6,500 up to 10. Uh, so that's going to allow folks in that age range uh, to be able to throw in an additional $3,500 uh, into uh, their IRAs. Uh, that's really positive, right? It allows mm-hmm. your balance to grow uh, higher and sort of reflective of the reality in totality with those two changes. Uh, that, you know, the further along in your career you get, more likely you have dollars to save. And also, we tend to work a little bit longer as Americans these days. And so, and especially if you're living longer. Totally. Having flexibility mm-hmm. there uh, is really, really critical. Um, there is a downside, though, to the catch up side. And so, we should mention that for sure uh, is every catch up contribution moving forward uh, will be required uh, to be done on a post tax basis. Uh, so that's going to be a requirement that everything's done Roth. Uh, if you're throwing in a catch up okay. contribution, you're going to have to pay your tax upfront uh, and not get the benefit of the deferral, uh, you know, is uh, that you maybe had been able to uh, get access to in the past. Um, there is a cap, though. Uh, so everybody making less than one hundred and forty five thousand dollars a year can continue to make catch up contributions, however they so choose Roth or otherwise. But if you're making over $145,000 a year and a catch up contribution, you get it made, you're going to make it post tax dollars. Um, so so they can is, still do it, just post tax. Yeah. Still do it. It's just going to, mm-hmm. uh, you're not going to be able to uh, choose to go the option of getting the deferral. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some really big individual changes. A couple other ones that I'll highlight. And Evan, you tell me when you don't want me to keep rattling off provisions here. Um, Very good. The, Savers credit, or excuse me, not the savers credit. We can talk about the savers credit, but the savings, uh, what am I trying to say out loud here? Um, student loan contributions. There we go. I knew I was going to yeah. get to the point there eventually. This is a huge provision. Uh, and so currently, a lot of Americans come out of college, they've got a fair amount of student loan debt. Uh, and oftentimes, that can mean prioritizing paying down that student loan debt and putting off saving for retirement. Yeah, uh, This provision is going to be huge because what it's going to allow an employer to do is say, okay, you made a $200 uh, payment to your student loan debt this month. I'm going to treat that as an elective deferral and I'm going to make a, a $200 contribution into our retirement plan for you. Effectively treating your student loan as a matching or an eligible matching payment to be able to contribute uh, to your retirement account. So you're not going to have to make that judgment call anymore. You're going to be able to do both, pay down your debt and start to save for retirement. That to me is massive, especially for a lot of kids coming out of school with debt these days. I'll I'll be curious to see how much that's implemented because it's not a mandate, right? So like, okay. the employers still have to be generous enough to, to say, you know, we're going to offer that. Totally. Um, I think they will, Evan. I mean, honestly, like funny enough, I mean, like I had a couple of businesses that like either friends of mine or members uh, who own their own business kind of reach out to me and said, hey, well, like, what's that going to look like? Because I really want to be able to do that. I think, you know, if you're already offering a qualified plan Mm -hmm. and you've already got a matching component, it really doesn't, you know, stop you necessarily. It's not like an extra burden cost necessarily. 
Um, and I think, you know, in the tight labor market that we exist in, which I don't think mm -hmm. is going away anytime soon, mm -hmm. folks want talent. And this is one way they'll be able to, to sort of dangle a carrot in front of a protective uh, prospective employee. So I think the uptick should be reasonable on it. Um, and I think as it gets more prevalent in the market, it's going to start being like a standard feature versus like a bell or a whistle. Yeah, that'd be great. Depending on how people look at it. One thing I, I think the one of the biggest things I talk about with my clients on the Secure 2.0 is the change in the 529 yep. uh, overfunding, uh, I like to call it. So uh, instead of me kind of fumbling through it, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you explain the, the change. Yeah, it's, it's a big change. I mean, a lot of folks use 529 accounts to help prepare their kids for college to be able to set aside some resources on a tax variable basis. Um, you know, but there is a downside to 529s yeah. and which is they're relatively rigid. You got to use yeah. those dollars, uh, you know, for uh, qualified expenses, uh, you know, tuition, those sorts of things. Uh, and if you don't use it for that, you know, there's tax payments or tax penalties kind of associated with it. What Congress wants to be able to do here and is trying to help incentivize the American public is to utilize these accounts, uh, be able to, uh, you know, send their kids to college and give them a little uh, help on the way, but also not penalize them for being able to, or for going that route. Mm -hmm. and so what they're allowing is if an account, a 529 account has been open for 15 years. Uh, and you don't use it all. Your kid got a scholarship. Your kid decided to go to, uh, you know, didn't decide to go to college. Uh, you know, whatever the outcome is here, you can take thirty-five thousand dollars of that five twenty-nine, roll it, roll it over into an IRA without any associated tax penalties to it. So it allows. Now that's a, a that's a that's moving to a Roth IRA for the child. Is that right? No, uh, for, for you, it, it, it's for the parent for the retirement. depositor. Yep. Got it. And it's a, is it, was it Roth that, or I, I thought it was IRA a Roth. period. I, yeah, I'm not okay. sure exactly the function or which type. Um, it would and I believe it's still subject to the uh, contribution limits of five right. or $6,000 per year, right? So it'll take you a handful of years to get that extra 35,000 over into the IRA. Totally. Yeah. But nonetheless, still far more flexible than, than it was previously. Far more flexible and allows, you know, just a little bit more in terms of, again, holistic planning. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm not necessarily worried about putting my dollars in there, you know, something changes uh, with my kid uh, and allows, you know, hey, if you get an extra 35 grand put into your retirement savings uh, because your kid didn't go to college, uh, you know, and did it on a tax favorable basis, that's, that's not a bad outcome uh, for anybody for sure. Are you seeing anything getting done meaning, meaningful over the next uh, two years and uh, while President Biden is still uh, in office? And, uh, and then we'll spend a little time uh, about the, the next presidential race if, uh, if we can. Sure. Uh, it, it really, honestly, Evan, it depends on what you qualify as meaningful. I mean, yeah. federal government's a big place. Uh, there is lots of stuff going on. And I do believe there are avenues for bipartisan agreement. Um, you know, you sort of hinted at 2024, and that's important here. Uh, obviously, President Biden is officially in cycle now, hasn't officially, I guess, announced that he's running, but, you know, it's not really a whole lot of a doubt in most folks on that side. Uh, so he wants to continue to show, uh, you know, that his government is effective and is getting legislation accomplished uh, that helps Americans. It was a big focus last Congress. You've also got 24 Senate Democrats up in cycle, uh, you know, who are looking, especially those ones who find themselves in red states are looking to demonstrate that they work across the aisle. You've also got a bunch of House Republicans uh, who just got elected in places like California, New York, et cetera. Uh, those folks are going to want to continue uh, to, or to try to demonstrate that they're effective legislators uh, and they can get bipartisan work done. So I do think uh, there's definitely impetus and a group of folks who are willing to do deals. Uh, and that's going to, you know, potentially spur folks into action. Um, it does seem like there's a little bit more bipartisan effort, like effort to go across the aisle today than there was uh, three or four years ago, right? Does that sound... You know, you I mean, anytime that? you're in divided Congress, you have to. I mean, yeah. that's the only yeah. way to get something done. Right. Uh, you know, you can kind of spin your wheels in the democratically controlled Senate and spin your wheels in the republicanly held, uh, you know, House. Uh, but if you can't find something that the two sides can collaborate on, you're just spinning your wheels because, yeah. you know, nothing's going to get done. So definitely last Congress, um, you know, is one of the most uh, of, uh, one of the most productive Congresses we've had in the last 50 years. When you do chips, when you do gun reform, when you do, uh, you know, obviously infrastructure, CARES Act, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, that's an awful lot of stuff to get done in one Congress. 
So this year, I mean, we'll see. I think the farm bill, obviously, is something that gets done every five years, and that's important. Does you know things like uh, food stamps, et cetera, in addition to setting the agriculture policy uh, for the country. Obviously, uh, you know stuff like uh, the FDA uh, reauthorization. We want to all make sure that we can fly in planes and do so safely. Uh, so there's a lot of things that will have to get done on a bipartisan basis. Clearly, that in China, I think, is probably something that brings both parties together. China, for certain uh, is something that, you know, will bring folks together. And look, I mean, the last couple of days, Evan, not a shock to you, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, now all of a sudden we've got banking insecurity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's going to cause a lot of attention and focus. I'm getting off this pod and going to talk to a member of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, there's been a bunch of conversations uh, in both parties over the course of the weekend about what do we do? I mean, what's yeah. the right path forward here and, and seeing if we can stall this? Um, and obviously inflation underpins everything in every conversation that folks are yeah, having. Right. But clearly biggest political story this year on without a doubt is debt ceiling and funding the government. I mean, uh, you know, still waiting to see what exactly the X date is. And of course, that's when uh, the federal government no longer has the dollars or the ability to use what we call extraordinary measures uh, to be able to meet the obligations of the country. And therefore, we're going to default. Uh, Some folks have speculated it's middle of June. I don't think that's right. Uh, More likely to be, uh, you know, sometime in the early fall, but potentially could even stretch all the way to the end of the year. Finding and unwinding that Gordian knot is going to be really, really tricky for this Congress. Uh, I doubt very honestly that there are votes in the House of Representatives, just Republican votes, uh, to be able to move any package, um, you know, full stop period, even if it was one that Republicans wrote down and said, this is exactly what we want. I don't think they can necessarily get the votes to pass anything in the House, which means they're going to need Democratic votes to do so. uh, And that just gets into tricky because it's hard to do any sort of spending cuts. Mm -hmm. If you're taking Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid off the table, defense, uh, and now I got to bring Democratic votes that Democrats don't want to vote for that sort of stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's going to be hard. uh, And that's going to drive the conversation. But it's going to be our biggest bipartisan achievement this year is debt ceiling and then funding the government uh, for next year, too. So Mm -hmm. lots, lots, as always, going on. And are we are we really going to have a a repeat of of 2020? Is that there's just no way of, of avoiding that? You know, I think for me, and we'll see. Obviously, the president hasn't made an official announcement uh, that he's running or not running. I suspect he is. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't hear, read, see, have conversations, uh, you know, with folks saying that he isn't. So I think that's right. Now, I think the Republican primary is going to be fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, <laughs> you know, former <laughs> President Trump is, is in the mix again. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this, uh, Ron DeSantis, government of Florida, or governor of Florida, is about to announce in the upcoming weeks, I'm certain, there's already a couple of folks like Nikki Haley. I think Tim mm-hmm. Scott's going to get in soon, et cetera. So I think the dynamic really to focus on is there is President Trump and he's got a really strong base of supporters, especially amongst Republican primary voters. He's going to get 30, 40 percent of the vote each race, sort of regardless in each state, unless something dramatic changes, which is always possible. Sure. Um, and then you're going to have a whole bunch of people who are going to be trying to be the not Trump vote. And that doesn't necessarily mean never Trumpers, as, you know, some folks have been identified in the Republican Party, but just the not Trump vote. If one person, say Ron DeSantis, can knock out every other challenger and sort of coalesce uh, those voters who don't want to see the former president uh, be the Republican nominee, uh, then, you know, there's a chance there. If there's multiple folks, President Trump's numbers are still really, really solid. Uh, and you could easily see a repeat of what we saw in 20, uh, where you know votes were splintered. Uh, President Trump won a bunch of early primaries because he was getting 20, 30 percent. Nobody else was getting above 10. Uh, and then eventually the math just wears people out and President Trump's the nominee. And then, yeah, we could be looking at a redo, uh, which I, you know, a lot of folks is maybe not their first preference. I totally understand that. Uh, But we're also going to have really competitive uh, House races. We're going to have really competitive Mm -hmm. Senate races. And for me, you know, like, I think everybody says this evidence really awful. So I apologize for using the cliche. But like, this is a really important election, setting aside like everything else. 
specifically for tax policy mm -hmm. uh, because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, was passed in 2017. It's what you know gave you a reduction in your taxes, brought the corporate rate down, et cetera. All that expires end of 2025. And yeah. so what's going to happen on that front, your tax is going to go back up. That's the standard deduction going to go down, all those sorts of things are tied to who's sitting at the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. So if it's President Biden or if it's President Trump, that's a different outcome. If it's mm -hmm. a Democratic House, that's a different outcome. If it's a Republican Congress, that's a different outcome. Uh, and that will dictate largely uh, you know, tax policy in this country for at least the next 10 years uh, in 2025, maybe even longer than that. So uh, a pretty important election when you get down on the dollars and cents piece too. Yeah, it's a great point. The tax taxes are changing. It's just, just a matter of how. Yeah. How and when? How and yeah. when? Well, Josh, I think that's uh, going to wrap it up for us. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, and for the listening audience, if you have any more questions about Secure 2.0 or anything we talked about, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, don't forget to hit subscribe, like uh, on YouTube, all the all the good stuff that has you remember to, uh, to keep listening to us. So thanks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cool.